The much maligned Iowa wide receivers were made a big question going into 2024. Could this position group actually be a strength for Iowa football? Today, Locked On Hawkeyes. You are Locked On Hawkeyes, your daily podcast on the Iowa Hawkeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, welcome in. I'm Trent Condon, and this is the Lockdown Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Lockdown Hawkeyes your first listen every day. We're available wherever you find podcasts. You can also watch us on YouTube. While you're there, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Helps us get in front of more Hawkeye fans. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. As the playoffs have finished up, the sports just stop sporting like we want them to. But this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Well, as we work our way through the football season, we will flip the calendar this week to August. August camp is here. We have football. It is going to be here. In fact, this week we have actual real live football games. Yes, it's preseason of the NFL. Who cares? It's a Chicago it's better, at least from this vantage point, but it is getting here. And as we count down the days until we'll get our only glimpse of Iowa football for the only time in an actual practice setting uh, coming up with Kids Day here in a couple of weeks, we continue to talk about these position groups and the different avenues of this squad and what's going to make 2024 a chance to be a highly success successful year for Iowa football. Look, we know the expectations coming in, and expectations have been at times a dirty word for Iowa football. It has been something that throughout the Kirk Ferentz tenure, when they've had their most op opportunity, I guess you would say, uh, to really close in in a big season, they haven't been able to do that. And there's been a myriad of reasons, and we've talked about a lot of them here throughout these spring and summer months about some of the reasons that it's come to fruition. But when you look at this squad, when we go position by position, today in the spotlight is the wide receiver position. Look, it's much maligned. And what it has been decimated to over the last couple of years is just absolutely unthinkable. I will wide receiver in comparison to tight end, offensive line, defensive line, defensive backs, heck, even quarterbacks. It's at a different level. Amir smith marset has been able to hang around. He was the first guy in a long time to be able to be any kind of impact player at the next level in the NFL. We've seen guys get cups of coffee, but I mean, we think back of some of the best wide receivers of the Kirk Ferentz era. We think of a Marvin McNutt. You go back and you talk about a Mo Brown or a CJ Jones. Those guys didn't have a whole lot of chance at the league at the wide receiver position. Now, this isn't trying to paint things that all of a sudden I was got to figure out the wide receiver position because Frankly, that's not even close to truthful. And we're not going to try to steer you in that direction, try to say uh, something that, about this group that just isn't true because this team does have a long ways to go still to be even minimally competent at the Big Ten level. They're a long ways from that. However, there are reasons for optimism. We talked about last week, if you are an everyday or you know about this, that there were wide receivers listed as stars this year. I think the the excitement about Jared Bowie, a young man as a redshirt freshman out of Florida, you got that component baiting, backing him up. You have Howard, big wide receiver, has that prototypical X size. We get excited about that. So the six wide receivers that they have listed. You know, the other component to that is Jacob Gill, who comes in at least out of this group with about as much Big Ten experience as anybody. He comes in from Northwestern. And he's not even listed in this too deep. Now, this is not some knock on Jacob Gill. I think more than anything, it just shows you that, A, they're happy with the guys that they have, but also he hasn't gone through practice. <laughs> and, and that's a component to it, too. You know, the quarterback position is a little bit different with Brandon Sullivan coming in, and he's being listed as the number three, what I think what many of us anticipate is going to be ultimately the backup quarterback position. But let's talk about this group as we kind of dive through a little bit deeper and we look at this wide receiver group and the reasons for optimism. We start, as we always have to, with Caleb Brown. Caleb Brown has, I guess, as much fast twitch, as much athleticism. This is a guy that was a high-level running back in high school. And Ohio State and many other programs across the country saw him and saw probably not going to be a guy that can translate at that level as a guy at the running back position. But because of that size, the speed, the versatility that he has, he can be a slot receiver. He can be a guy that lines up wide and can be an impactful player. 
So impactful, in fact, in fact, that Ohio State two years ago, when they had as loaded of a wide receiver room as maybe anybody in college football, what did they do? They played him. In fact, we found out they played him five games, and now he is a junior as opposed to a sophomore in terms of eligibility. We just found that out this summer, which is disappointing, but that aside, look, Caleb Brown is going to have to be a big-time wide receiver. If this at least a C-plus this season, and I think that's not starting out on a curve by any means, but if they could even do that this year, that would be a win for this Iowa offense, and Caleb Brown has to be a big part of that. We saw at the end of last season what he could do. Just get the ball in his hands. Does he do everything exactly right at the wide receiver position? Still, no. Remember, this is a guy that's still learning. But because he can be such a high-impact player, Caleb Brown has to be a huge champ, a part of what they do this season. Seth Anderson's the one that's odd. You know, Seth Anderson is a guy that I had high expectations for a year ago. Has the big grab early on in the season. In the opener, looks like the Iowa offense is going to be able to hit that 25 points per game. Brian's going to save his job. Everything's going to, well, yeah, we, we know how that obviously turned out after that. Now, continue to hear, and I've never heard anything officially, kind of what the injury is, but that Seth Anderson was banged up last year, that he played through a lot of injuries a year ago because there were so many times when he was out there, but he just wasn't impactful. Blame the quarterback? Absolutely. Uh, McNamara, before he was injured, wasn't very good, and we know what happened after he was injured with the ACL tear, just how hideous it got at the position. So, yes, you can blame that. When you're talking about this wide receiver group, that's very easy to do. It's easy to point to some of the ineptitudes of the other part. Offensive line, just still not good enough. And certainly in pass blocking, we saw this past season, they weren't good enough in that avenue to make them a high-impact team on that side of the football. Running the ball was better. Still have a long, long ways to go, though, as a pass blocking unit. If this Iowa offensive line is going to take a step forward and go hand-in-hand -hand with this wide receiver group. And he could, of course, blame the play caller. And we've gone down that path many, many times before. And we'll stay away. So we got Seth Anderson out there. Uh, again, I would love to see a healthy season, what he can do. You put up that numbers, and I don't care what level you're playing at. You do it as a youngster, as he did at Charleston Southern. I think that's eye-opening, uh, being at the FCS. And remember, it's it's not like everybody else on his team. Well, you know, this guy moved up to, to Iowa and played Big Ten football. You know, he's just beating up on everybody else. Well, remember his teammates, too. You know, we're also playing at that level. It's not like he was off alone on an island doing this thing against a, a bunch of miscreants. That, that's not the case at all with Seth Anderson. So I'm excited for him and to see what he can do this year. And then we continue to hear about Caleb Weechin and what he's going to be part of this offense. He's going to be, you know, the Riley McCarron, the, the guy that just catches everything. Things he's got incredible speed, and that's incredibly important for Iowa. You need to have those fast guys out there being able to stretch the defense. And if you're going to try to stretch the defense from time to time, if you do that, great. Are you going to take a shot, or is it just a guy out there that's just running a fly pattern, just running a nine straight up the field, but you're never going to throw it to him? And because of that, the defense in turn they're not being stretched. You can't just run routes with guys. There has to be reasons behind it. And that was something I thought the former offensive coordinator really struggled with was not early in the game, but then taking what you did, what you learned in the early portions of the game or what you worked to set up in the early portions of the game, and then actually use them later on. Use them in the second, the third, the fourth quarter. And it's one thing to set up a play, but to do it continuously. And if you're just going to be running nine patterns straight up the field, and nobody's ever going to throw the ball down there, you're going to look like Iowa's offense has looked for the last two and a half seasons. Some names. I mentioned Jacob Gill, too. That, that's another one. Again, if Jacob Gill could have 15 catches. In fact, let's do that. When we continue here, let's talk about some realistic numbers for this wide receiver group. Because at times, I talk about the wide receivers, and we get a little excited. I, I think there's some juice there. And then people come running back and say, whoa, 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 they, they, these guys stink. There's no chance. Where should our expectations be? We're going to take a look at those numbers and what the expectations are. Plus, a little bit of buzz happening in Iowa basketball land. Not for the great things. We'll talk about that here as we roll through. This is the Locked On Hawkeyes Podcast. Today's episode of Locked On Hawkeyes brought to you by Iowa. Single sunscreen, snacks for the kids. In fact, right now as we're out on 
vacation family vacay for the year. What do these have in common? You're probably buying a ton of them this summer, but don't stress about the cost. Use Ibotta and get cash back on all your purchases when you stock up on your summer essentials. Ibotta is the free app that lets you earn cash back every time you shop, even on hundreds of items from groceries, beauty supplies, even toys. You can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you're, pur uh, what you're purchasing. The average Ibotta user earns $256 per year. That could cover the cost of an entire shopping trip, that flight you've been eyeing, or a fancy dinner that you've been craving. It's time that you joined up with over 50 million users who use Ibotta to earn cash back every time they buy and shop. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5, five bucks just for trying Ibotta by using the code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE when you register. Just go to the App Store or Google Play and download the free Ibotta app and start earning cash back. Again, use the code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE. That's I-B-O-T-T-A in the Google Play or App Store. And make sure to use that code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE. Today's episode of Lockdown Hawkeyes is also brought to you by our fan friends at Factor. Warmer, sunnier days, they are here throughout the summer months. Time to fuel them up with Factors. No prep. No the menu of chef crafted meals with options like calorie smart, protein plus and keto factor fresh never frozen meals are dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes so no matter how busy you are you'll always find time to enjoy nutritious great tasting meals take a look at what you can do and start a new healthy routine what have you been waiting for they have 35 different meals over 60 add-ons and you choose them every week. New flavors to explore for you each and every time. Crush your wellness goals this month with dietitian approved meals and ingredients that you can trust. Make your day delicious from breakfast to dessert. Stay fueled and with easy, nutritious options. Treat yourself to restaurant, restaurant quality meals that feature premium ingredients like filet mignon, shrimp, and blackened salmon. Head to factormeals.com slash college and use code college 50 to get 50% off your first box, plus you'll get 20% off your next month. Once again, that's code locked on college 50 five zero at factormeals.com slash locked on 50. That'll get you that 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. Trey kind of back with you once again here on the Lockdown Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Lockdown Hawkeyes your first listen every day. So we're talking about expectations. The wider group, it has been inconsistent. It's been downright bad. A couple of years ago, they were down to, what, three scholarship wide receivers at one point during August camp. It's been dreadful. I mean, there's no two ways about it. It's been a disappointment. Recruiting has been awful. Yet here we are. You still got to play the position, right? I can't go out there with one running back and four tight ends. Well, they can. In fact, they did it a few times a season ago. It's not a recipe for offensive success. How about we just put it that way? Let's simplify things as much as possible on that front. Not what many teams are going to do in 2024 to win football games, certainly at the Big Ten level. All right, that aside. So we talked about some of the players, some of the guys. And this is where I like to go and just look at where your expectations are. I believe that Caleb Brown, even as he is suspended for the first game of the season, I believe that he's going to have a big year. I believe that he is going to put together a huge season by Iowa wide receiver standards in 2024. Again, what does that mean? If I put numbers out like this, Caleb Brown over 11 regular season games catches 40 balls for 585 yards and five touchdowns. Does that sound crazy to you? Does that seem too high? Does that seem too low? Because I think that is a solid season because of what we've seen out of an Iowa wide receiver. If he puts that together, I'd be happy. But I know other people hear those numbers. They scoff. They roll their eyes. They say, that's dreadful. If that's what you're looking for from your number one wide receiver, that's why you're the 131st ranked offense a year ago at all of college football. And you'd be right. But that shows you where our expectations are. Jacob Gill, if he catches 20 balls this year, he surpasses what he's 
find in his collegiate career. And I think that's a realistic baseline. Seth Anderson, I have a little bit higher, kind of in between those two guys. 30 catches, something like that, maybe 35, if he can be healthy all season long. Could he be the guy that suddenly is up there and catches five, six, seven, eight touchdown passes in a year? You know, and we have all these conversations and we don't bring tight end because it's own position group. Maybe we should though. You know, maybe this should be a part of it that should be a deeper part of the conversation is that wide receiver position because they don't do go in tandem. Or maybe that's just because we know how bad it's been at this group and we're grasping for straws for anything to happen. A couple other guys. Uh, I think the most difficult one for me is Weechin. So we saw him a year ago. He was used exclusively in the jet sweep game. They tried a couple of times in the passing game to get the ball to him. It didn't go very well. There was, I, th I think, a couple of plays that were almost intercepted. So it hasn't gone well on that front. So you're left kind of with that part of it. I, I He's probably the most difficult one for me to put a number. If you had to put a number out, over under number of catches from this year, is it 12? You know, one, one a game? Is that too high? Is that too low? That's one that I'm struggling with. And maybe the most intriguing um, to me that we're going a little bit deeper down the wide receiver position is Terrell Washington Jr. Just because much like the skill set of a Caleb Brown and how that's gone. I, I think that's another portion uh, that you look at and see, all right, are they are they making a specific role for that slight slot type of receiver? Is that what we're going to see from Terrell Washington? Is he going to be a guy that can go out and do that? We talked about the two redshirt freshmen this year with Jared Bowie. What's the number for him? Is it 25 catches? If Jared Bowie goes out this year and averages even two and a half catches a game, how about that? 36 catches this year. Averages, you know, a standard 15 yards per reception, has four touchdowns. Uh, for Iowa standards, again, that's highly successful. And here's the scary thing. You kind of go the other direction, and if he would have that kind of season, oh, that transfer portal, oh, you wonder about that component to it, too. Is there any young guys that are there uh, that can help out this season? Could it be a K.J. Parker uh, comes in during his freshman campaign? Could he be a guy this year? Reese Vanderzee, we know he certainly got the size as he finished up his uh, high school career and wrapped things up and doing it in a multitude of different sports. You know, is he a guy that's able to come in this year? We're just kind of all over the place, which is okay. I mean, that's the reality when we're talking about a group that we don't know, and it goes hand in hand now with Tim Lester and what Tim Lester is going to mean for this offense. I know Chad Leistikow had an opportunity and you'll hear that later this week. If you're a listener to his podcast or radio show by radio station KXNO, you'll have an opportunity to hear that. And I know um, hearing Chad, he was very excited about the interview. I've been sold a bill of goods before. Look, I was not, seven, eight years ago now. I was not about having Brian Ferentz be the offensive coordinator. I thought there were too many things that could go poorly and not a good enough good things that could go in a positive direction. That's where I was. It wasn't personal. It wasn't in vendetta against him. I just didn't like how it was going to work. And really my biggest thing is what came to fruition. When it came time to fire him, it was going to be incredibly difficult. We saw how difficult it was. But people talked me into it, and I started to go down that line and, and talk myself into it. Tim Lester, I think you remember, and if you're an everyday or you do, when he was hired, after it looked like it was down to a couple of ca uh, candidates for the job, after we found out that Paul Christ had moved on from the job or it just wasn't happening for whatever reason, we found that out. They were down to the finalist, and it goes to Tim Lester. I wasn't happy. I really wasn't. And this is not me buying into a bunch of, I don't know, talking points that come in from the athletic department or anything like that. I think anybody that really knows me, they know the ways that I do things here, uh, That's I'm not going to fall victim to those kind of things. He just said the right things. And he says it in a way that I think makes you believe, makes you believe that this can work. It has worked before. We have seen good offenses under Kirk Ferentz. And I know for seeing young people, it's, it's very difficult to believe or understand. But yes, it has happened before. And it can happen again. Iowa can get back there. In today's environment, can they be what they were 22 years ago, the 2002 team? No, I don't think so. I think with the pace of play, the way the teams operate in the, today's day and age. And remember, that defense also gave up some points in his own right. 
And this defense isn't going to be at that kind of level, giving up points. Because of all that, I don't think we're going to see approaching top 25 levels. Top 50? Probably not even this year. And again, those expectations probably are too high this year. But this is what we went into and what we talked about here today. You just you talk yourself into different ways, and everybody's perception can be a whole lot different. Wrapping things up, we talked about the Iowa strength of schedule this year and Iowa having a path to make the college football play. We'll talk about that path here just a little bit and what some numbers say about Iowa's strength of schedule. Plus, a glimmer of hope. Will there be a McCaffrey once again playing for Fran and the Iowa men's basketball team? Doesn't look too good. We'll talk about that as we come back. This is Locked On Hawkeyes. Today's episode of the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast is brought to you by FanDuel and the FanDuel Sportsbook. Look, I love sports. I love them so much. I just never want them to stop. But as the playoffs have finished up, we're getting fewer and fewer games. The sports just don't sport like I want them to. FanDuel, though, they let me keep the sports going just the way that I want, whenever I want. All I have to do is open up the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. This summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. They got you covered. You're taking a look at the Hawkeyes to win the Big Ten. They got some games of the year up there, including the matchup against Iowa State. We're in Kinnick Stadium. Iowa is just a a two-and-a-half point favorite against the Cyclones, and they got a whole lot more. FanDuel official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Once again, head over to FanDuel.com. That's FanDuel.com, and start making the most out of your summer. Trent Connor back with you one final time on the Lockdown Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Lockdown Hawkeyes your first listen every day. As we wrap things up here on a Monday, I uh, want to start first with an article that comes in on the football front from Tom Fernelli over at CBSSports.com. Tom, even as I believe in Illinois, yeah, I think that's what it is. Still football and specifically, uh, he went through and he rated the team's schedules, strict schedule coming up this season. Now, I went into the article anticipating out of the 18-team Big Ten that Iowa was probably going to be 16th, 17th, maybe the easiest schedule in the Big Ten this year overall. And though it's one of the easier ones, it's not towards the complete bottom of the list. It is 13th out of 18 teams. Uh, this is what Fernelli has to say. The Hawkeyes will play seven home games this year, and that's a good chance that they'll win all seven. Yes, the home slate features Iowa State, Washington, Wisconsin, Nebraska, but the Hawkeyes should be favored versus all of them. On the other side, while I will have to go on the road to face Ohio State, the rest of the road slate isn't terrible either. All in all, Ohio State is only one of the top four favorites to win the league based on odds the Hawkeyes have to face. The reason Iowa's schedule is ranked this high is while there are fewer elite teams on it, there aren't any cups and cakes outside of the opener against Illinois State. And that's, you know, kind of the way that we have looked at this. Because, yes, you can point out and say Iowa doesn't have to play Michigan, Penn State, Oregon this season, USC. What a joke of a schedule. And when you look at it only in that realm, and there's some people that only want to look at it, the top tier teams that you face, and that is your schedule, that's true. But you also don't get the dregs of the conference this year. And there's no matchups against teams that are anticipated that are going to be at the absolute bottom of the Big Ten this year. And that's another reason that Iowa schedule, there's a lot of winnable games in there. There's also plenty of games that they could lose. And you could see those coin flip games start to go the other way. So I thought a good stuff there. Uh, speaking of that article, the easiest schedule this year is Indiana. Very manageable schedule uh, for the Hoosiers this season at the top of the list, UCLA. We talked about this during Big Time Media Days a week ago as uh, we saw Deshaun Foster be the first up before Kirk Ferentz and his uh, speak had that weird opening statement. But that aside, it was a look at their schedule and just how difficult the Bruins are going to have it, including our Hawkeyes making their way there in November. We'll see kind of what's left in the tank at that point in time for that UCLA squad. And then one final thing on the basketball front, as Jack McCaffrey has made his commitment and he is going to be a Butler Bulldog. I understand um, some people out there that are wondering, 
What does this say about Iowa basketball? What does this say about Fran McCaffrey in his future? And I believe that that, that is short-sighted. I feel, feel real momentum in this basketball. But perhaps a sense of belonging again, a sense of normalcy for Fran McCaffrey. For the first time in eight seasons, not having one of his sons being coached by him, I think that's impactful. I look at what Iowa did with limited funds in comparison to much of their Big Ten brethren and what they did in the transfer portal, bringing in a very competent at minimum starting point guard and a guy that can run your team and has done it at a high level, yes, at the mid-major level, and Drew Thelwell, but a guy that makes a whole lot of sense for what Iowa does. They have an incumbent in Brock Harding, a guy that anticipate is going to be there, but for a one-year stopgap, Thelwell is almost the perfect guy. You can, at times, maybe play them together. At others, a veteran presence and a guy that just knows how to be a point guard at the college level. That's a good thing, I think, eventually down the line for what we have with Brock Hardy. And then you go out and you find what many people consider a diamond in the as they welcome in Treyor from Manhattan. This guy, we talked about the numbers, we talked about the statistical profile of him, what he was and what he was going to be, but it didn't paint the whole picture. And as he's arrived on campus, as he's gone through, and as he's been practicing more and more and going through more and more workouts, we continue to hear great things about him. And that, again, is one of the strengths of Fran McCaffrey is identifying talent. Yes, have we been on the doorstop with so many high-level prospects that it gets frustrating? No doubt about it. Guess who else had the same thing? Lou Dolson. Mark Aguirre, Isaiah Thomas. Uh, there were some big time names and those, some close calls going way back then. Dr. Tom, Nick Collison, Rafe Friends. I understand Collison. It was during the lame duck year, but the close calls, the ones that didn't go Iowa's way and how could have changed the perception. And the same thing happens with Fran. And, and we go on and on and with this. It's only one team can win in recruiting, right? This isn't where you're going to play 160 games. Over the course of a Saturday in college basketball, it is completely different because of that. There's only one winner in recruiting every single time. And Fran, though, he can identify talent. He's done a really good job of it. He'll do it without Jack McCaffrey, who goes on to Butler. And good for Jack. Look, very difficult circumstances, what happened last summer. But as I stated, I think this is a good thing, not just for Jack, and to get out of Iowa City, forge your own path, frustrating thing is I thought he was going to be one heck of a player, and I think he's going to be one heck of a player and probably a better collegiate player than either brothers were. And that's frustrating from the fan aspect, but there's a whole lot more here. And he saw what it was like playing for his father, not actual hearing from dad, but from the fan base. It was ugly at times, and there were times that I had things to say as well. I mean, that goes with the territory, and it's going to be different for Jack McCaffrey. Is this going to lead for this being Fran's last year? I don't see it. I was there maybe a few months ago. Not anymore. Maybe it could be just hope for me that this thing's going to be turned around. We're going to see a big bounce back season. They're back in the NCAA tournament. They finally break through and get into the second weekend. It could be hope. We'll see. We'll see you tomorrow here at Lockdown Hawkeyes. As always, thanks for making Lockdown Hawkeyes your first listen every day. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen every day. For your second listen, don't forget to enjoy Locked On College Football and the Locked On College Football Podcast. Spencer McLaughlin gets you ready for an exciting season on the gridiron with discussion on the upcoming season and the ever-changing landscape of college athletics, including conference realignment, the transfer portal, NIL, new college football expanded playoffs, and a whole lot more. Locked On College Football is available on YouTube and wherever you get podcasts. All part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We got you covered on the Hawkeye front. We'll talk to you again tomorrow as we continue our deep dive into Iowa football. Oh, it is getting closer as we make our way through. Again, thanks for making Lockdown Hawkeyes your first listen every day. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. Go Hawks.